many people are gonna say, how do I make money out of this? Well, actually, there is a profit that needs to be made, but let me argue today, who needs to profit from this? Earth needs to profit from all of our decisions first. Once she profits, then we have a chance then to become more wealthy. And let me define wealth this way. The only true wealth maker is sunshine and photosynthesis. It creates and captures carbon out of the atmosphere. It takes nitrogen out of the atmosphere all free and it builds the nutrients that feed life. It builds the life in the soil and the biodiversity, and it creates all the food that we need to eat on this planet. And today we have with us Tim LaSalle. Tim is a, a longtime regenerator, shall we say. He's been around the world. He has worked as uh, executive director of uh, the Savory Institute Center for Holistic Management. And he was the first CEO at the Rodale Institute. And he further went on to um, work in various places around the world, helping people turn land that was unproductive into far more beneficial uh, beneficial processes um, and, and productivity. <clears throat> he was the CEO of the California Agricultural Leadership Program and arranged meetings and programs in more than 80 countries with heads of state, ministers, and others. And he questioned the apparent human impulse to destroy that which, that which nourishes us and uh, there is a distinction between doing that in a complex society and doing that in an indigenous society. Um, but this perception of how we kind of are canaries in search of a coal mine has, um, has led Tim to study depth psychology. And he had a dissertation which is titled Awakening to Ecocide. And right now he is um, head of or co-founder of the Center for Regenerative Agriculture at California State University in Chico. So Tim, uh, welcome. Tim, um, why don't you tell us, uh, start by telling us what regenerative agriculture is. Thank you very much, Adam. It's a pleasure to be with you today to talk about this topic from the standpoint that we have found ourselves obviously in an existential crisis. And I'm a Californian, sixth generation, and I'm living here now. And we all know what's going on with the fires in the West uh, as a real example of what climate impact is going to be and likely to get worse in the future. That's one of the driving points with regard to why the regenerative agriculture question. So I come from agriculture, I come from a farm, I come from early years of being a professor, teaching sort of high input scientific agriculture. But in traveling the world, being in over 90 some countries over the course of decades, it became clear to me that we weren't headed in the right direction. And it's not just in agriculture, but agriculture is a pivotal element of this because we all eat three times a day, hopefully, uh, we get that opportunity. We know there's 800 million people in the world that do not. Uh, but in fact, uh, it's a, an act, as w uh, Wendell Berry said, um, eating is an agricultural act. And that means that our engagement as humans with the food we eat is actually directing what's going on in our biosphere, in our, on our planet, and also directly affecting climate unfortunately, for the most part, negatively. But regenerative agriculture is the one element that every one of us can participate in that can turn the tide on emissions. In other words, we can reduce the emissions agriculture does create all on its own, but we can capture more carbon than anyone imagined. And I hope to offer a few of those data points today in this conversation. And so what drove me to it was this sort of desperation of what are we doing as humans to each other and to life on earth 
And what can we do to turn that tide and to change our consciousness and to change our relationship to earth, perhaps much more to an indigenous relationship of honoring a life and how it sustains our life. So let me stop there and, and come back to you um, for direction on this, because I have a few points I want to make about what's happening to soil. I want to have a few points to make about how we bring life back to it. And certainly we have an opportunity today to talk about human behavior in this equation. Shall I? Uh, I'm eager to hear about um, your examples and adventures. But just to start off, could you say something about your PhD in depth psychology? Um, what is the intersection between depth psychology and regenerative agriculture? Well, let me say this, is that um, in working in that leadership program that I did for 25 years and developing leaders, and some of them ended up in Congress, some of them ended up in the state house here, actually the last three secretaries of agriculture in California all were engaged with that program. Um, but also it strikes me that when I, when I was doing that is, is that so much of our solution based orientation to how we fix problems, if it's, if it's from a, a policy standpoint, or if it's in our community, or even if it's in our family, it's based on kind of rational decision making. You can read all those leadership books, how you accomplish and get to certain goals. But what all of it lacked, as I observed and watched and looked at things globally, was a systems approach, a whole systems approach, because things only operate in whole systems. And any time we work with just one element, it's like putting a Band-Aid on a, on a disease, and that doesn't fix it. We have to go to some of the core root elements, and then we have to know where the leverage points are to change it. One of those leverage points, of course, is our own consciousness as humans, as to how we relate with the life support systems on earth. And unfortunately, I, I would posit that part of the separation is as we've become more urbanized, we have absolutely gotten into concrete canyons, lacking a real relationship with earth and nature. And our relationships are more mental or now virtual and computer and disconnected from nature. And that starts to pull us into a question of depth, of depth psychology. And I'll have a point to make about that. I am not giving those of us that live rurally and, and, and our farmers any uh, real slack in this conversation because we can quickly become swept up into that disconnected world. Um, farmers are on their iPhones, they're on their computers. You should see their tractors and combines and harvesters that can sense the amount uh, of uh, material being harvested out of a field as it moves across the field that's geo, the GPS um, driven. Um, but in fact, what I do want to say with regard to the depth realm is, is that I knew we had to go beyond behavioral psychology because behavioral psychology is trying to put a carrot out there and bring people towards an, a thinking, a way of being. And we know how hard it is for us to change our own personal behavior. And, and so, and do we get conscious enough? And, and I'll make a quick point about this. 80% of our decisions are made unconsciously. It means the split second before we've thought about that decision, we've already made it. And the American Psychological Association became very clear on that in 1909, when Carl Jung and, and Sigmund Freud came to Clark University to give a lecture and talk about the human unconscious. And they created Madison Avenue, the whole marketing realm. And marketing and advertising is very successful in engaging the unconscious realms of pulling us into decisions that are not thoughtful and they're not conscious. They're, they feed into a desire in an unconscious realm. So that unfortunately is part of why we're on an ecocidal trail because that's a suicidal track that we're on when we say no, we're for life. And how can that tension live within us? It's partly because a lot of our unconscious pieces are not looking, they're not conscious, can't deal with the whole, but feed into desires or wants or insecurities or needs for affirmation that override what we might be if we were a truly settled, deeply rooted, connected, conscious human. 
and that's not going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> so we can't accomplish that today. But what we can do is to begin to shift our way of being with earth and our way of being with each other from the standpoint, if we're intuitive, is to listen more to that intuition. If we are more sensate, like Jung would say, and we do methodical things, then to start to make our approach and lists of how we're going to behave. And th those are the things, too, that are important. Jung also said, are you a feeling kind of person or are you a thinking kind of person? And the feeling kind of person can come into a relationship with each other and with earth more in a heart center. A thinking is going to be more head. And in, in the head centeredness, we have to spend more time sort of monitoring that because the heart usually doesn't make mistakes when it comes to really being open to listening. Whereas the head gets the ego involved pretty fast or desires engage and we overstep what we may actually rationally claim we believe in. So well, let me, let me ask you ahead. a question here. Um, if it was the advertising public relations industry that put us or helped put us out of touch with planetary processes that that we need to be deeply in touch with can we flip that around can we do the reverse the way they did it or is that not reversible aspects of it are certainly reversible and one of the things about regenerative agriculture and the reason we're using the term regenerative agriculture and i might add we have a number of international companies talking to us at our research center up in chico is in fact that they know they as companies need to meet their carbon budgets. They know to have a business 20 years from now, we have to get a handle on climate change. And so they're, they're gonna try and work with us because they know they can have to turn the product they buy to change the way it's farmed. So instead of being a carbon emitter, it's a carbon capturing system. So there are, people, there are organizations making these decisions. We as individuals need to do that too. But a lot of what we're making in the public realms, we're giving this information away. We're not in a profit-focused uh, orientation. And part of your question, Adam, comes back to say, many people are gonna say, how do I make money out of this? Well, actually, there is a profit that needs to be made, but let me argue today, who needs to profit from this? Earth needs to profit from all of our decisions first. Once she profits, then we have a chance then to become more wealthy. And let me define wealth this way. The only true wealth maker is sunshine and photosynthesis. It creates and captures carbon out of the atmosphere. It takes nitrogen out of the atmosphere all free, and it builds the nutrients that feed life. It builds the life in the soil and the biodiversity, and it creates all the food that we need to eat on this planet. Everything else is an imagination around what is wealth that for the most part, if we've looked at how we've done it as a culture or as economies, it has been destructive to what maintains and produces life on this planet. And that we have to ethically take a hard look at and think about our relationship with that. Okay, well, from here, why don't you tell us some of the good news? <laughs> Let me, I will. Let me share just a few slides and then um, it, it will kind of probably start here with a little bit of, uh, of your saying, that's good news. Um, but in essence, you know, we are in a climate crisis and I'm using the pictures here, not the pictures from um, now Pensacola, Florida, but it seems like about every time I give a talk, I could pull pictures up of what's going on and how rapidly climate change is beginning to affect our present, not just our future. I can remember half a dozen years ago, we talked about a concern for our grandchildren. And many of us were saying, no, really look at the data. It's concern for now. And that's really the truth. We are in the present crisis today, and we have no time left to start to turn this thing around. What is co-joined with that is the fact that we're losing our soil because we are farming the way we have for 10,000 years. Uh, I hate to say it, but when Bill Gates said one of the greatest inventions ever was the plow, that was one of the biggest destructive uh, inventions ever and we simply are losing our soils mu so much faster than we can rebuild them. Although regenerative agriculture, here's the good news, can rebuild them much faster than any textbook will want to claim as possible. 
Well, so isn't we, that the difference between biological soils and geological soils? Yes, Adam, that's a good point because you know, uh, geological soils, it takes about a thousand years to build them. But in a regenerative biological living soil, and you and I were talking earlier before we started today, um, we would kind of like to define soil as the plant, the root, the biology, all of the beings that live in, in it and under it, and the mineral content of soil. Because it's a living system when it's healthy and when it works as Earth's skin to produce life on this planet. So regenerative agriculture basically is the farming and grazing practices that actually, among other benefits, reverse climate change. And yes, I'm going to tell you about how many megatons of carbon we could pull out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis. And this rebuilds the organic matter, restores degraded soils. And the work I was doing in Africa, uh, Howard Buffett had taken me there and he said, Tim, I'm going to give you some of the best, worst soils you can find. And that was sort of a, a joke, but it was a terrible soil. It was basically sand that got to be burning hot. Literally, you couldn't put your hand on it in the middle of the summer. You wonder how you grow anything on it. But we could when we started to do it through this living system. And that means we can take degraded, nutrient-deficient soils and through biology, liberate minerals that are bound up, create and capture the nitrogen and the, uh, and, the, and the carbon that's needed to make the plant and start to produce, and in my fields, increased yields by five times over what the smallholder farmers were getting. And I brought no outside inputs in, no fertilizers. And let me be really clear about that. The fertilizer industry is not needed. As a matter of fact, it's destructive. And you'll hear all the time, well, we need to feed people, we need fertilizers. You know what? Nature knows how to fertilize. Just look at a tropical forest and tell me in that hugely biodiverse, all, all that biomass produced, who brought the fertilizer? Oh, the biology did. The nature did. And we've, we're learning how we can do that in farm fields as well. And David Johnson is one of the guys, when I came back from Africa, that I ran into, one of the guys, he's the soil microbiologist, who began to explain to me what was going on in my fields, and I began to understand. And so this is a chance for us to change our paradigms away from input, tillage-based agriculture, which destroys these organisms. When you plow, you break up the fungal networks. When you put in salted fertilizers that are salt-based, you kill the organisms. And the plant shuts off from collaborating and working in unison with these organisms. But David said, let's move from this geochemical to a living biology and have a fungal dominant to bacterial ratio of one to one or greater. Actually, when it's about four to one more fungal organisms to bacterial, we end up with some of the most robust agricultural soils in the world that hold water, that build carbon, and that will leave that carbon in that soil for a thousand years because the outer shells of much of, the, of those fungal communities are very resilient to break down. We can learn that there's quorum sensing organisms that work together once it's robust and the plants asking and signaling for certain nutrients and it will actually even then start to create nutrients that they can't do on their own but they do it for the plant and this is where we also get self-fertilization. You know the soils I had in Africa were phosphorus deficient by all soil scientists measurements. But the truth of the matter is, there's phosphorus that's bound up. It's just plants can't access it unless there's this biology, which will liberate that phosphorus and carry it to the plant. And that's why my plants the first year showed phosphorus deficiencies, but never again, because the biology got strong enough and robust enough to take care of that shortage. And that's really fast. Oh, one year. That's, uh, it doesn't take long to bring life back. It's the exciting part. The carbon sequestration is too exciting and, and it's where we get pushback on this. But I'm gonna say with clarity, most of the, uh, of the work being done of, of drawdown, if you read uh, Paul Hawkins' book, of, of even the work coming out of France on the four per thousand on, on trying to get more carbon in the soil, look at a half a ton to less than a ton of carbon capture per acre per year. David Johnson's work and practical farms where we've gone and measured it have shown up to 10 tons of carbon per acre per year. 
That's a, a magnitude higher than what current science says is possible. We are now have research projects, five-year projects that we're going to, we're going to track this and replicate. And if we can get anywhere near that, we need to change all of our farming practices yesterday to this way to pull that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We could capture all of it uh, of what we're currently emitting. Now that's to say, don't stop emitting. I mean, don't reduce emitting. We have to reduce emitting and we have to do it today. But we also have to change the way we farm. And that means today too. We can get increased yields. We can get a reduced carbon respiration, which means less carbon is respired out of the soil naturally by the living system and more is held in, which makes this fantastic accretion, accumulation. That's how the black soils of the Midwest were made naturally. So just in Africa, this is some of the results that, that I had. I just put that up there for you all to see. And that here is the numbers on carbon that I just want to show. What's mentioned here in the green bar is beam. That's the biologically enhanced. That's the Johnson Sioux method of getting a fungal dominant living inoculant back into the soils that we've killed by the fertilizer and the tillage. And it will take all of these referred levels of wests at 0.57 tons or Nigli out of Switzerland at 0.2 or Raton Laos at 0.7 out of Ohio State. And it shows the difference that can be made when we bring the life and the biology and the fungal dominance back into the soil. And this is proven like on Gabe Brown's ranch in North Dakota, where he did it without the science. He did it just by bringing rotational grazing and cattle and cover crops and always keeping a live root in the ground and not disturbing the soil. So these are the kinds of things that are so exciting to us. And, and I'll stop sharing the screen. I know this, this piece will be um, offered uh, online so that there's contacts here that we can, uh, that anyone can access if they so choose. So the, there's the good news, Adam. That's what I wanted to be sure to get is that, is that if we change our eating habits by starting to ask for regeneratively produced food, if we demand of the companies or the, or the farmers that are bringing our food to learn about regeneration and say, let's capture that soil carbon. And, and then if you grow your own garden, do it in your own backyard. And in one of our sites there, you can connect to how you can make your own soil inoculant in your own backyard with your own leaves and, and uh, rakings and prunings out of your yard and create this fungal dominant system that can greatly enhance the level of health, both in your garden food. But I have to tell you, there's other benefits. Fungal dominant soils are not where weeds like to live. And the other thing is, in these healthy fungal dominant soils, the plants get so much healthier, they become distasteful to insects. So you, we, my wife and I in our garden, we have seen basically no insect damage this year. We, we occasionally weed a little bit, but there's hardly any weeding to do. And the crops are doing exceptionally well and even survived our 114 degree days out here. Uh, in the stress because the fungal communities keep moisture coming to the roots as well. So it's the way nature knows how to buffer and protect and feed and communicate and, and demineralize and transport water, nutrients and exchanges. And let me just say one thing, the plants don't just take from all this biology, they feed it. So they, through root exudates, emit sugars and carbohydrates feeding all those organisms to keep the symbiotic relationship going. It's a really exciting and complex and wonderfully miraculous system that nature has evolved. Uh, Tim, I think um, one of the most important things you're saying is, um, is your reverence for nature. And, and your faith built on uh, 150 years of experience and you don't look a day over 35, you're gonna have to <laughs> tell me how you do that sometime. But is your faith that, as Barry Commoner said in 1970, nature knows best. And just over the past couple of years, there's been this 
beginnings of an exponential curve. Uh, we don't like the, the COVID exponential curve or the climate exponential curve, but there's been a, a good exponential curve that's seemingly starting in regenerative agriculture with a flurry of new books and a flurry of new farms and new organizations. I'm on the internet practically all day and every day there are new people doing things or just discovering it, not realizing that they've got other cohorts around the world who are also now discovering it. And just to emphasize uh, the slide of David Johnson's that you showed, that is an extraordinary paradigm shift to think that you could get up to maybe 20 tons of carbon per acre per year eventually, 10 now for sure, but as David develops his, his uh, process, that is a huge in terms, not just of climate, but as you say, it's all a system. And I think it's something that we should all get very, very excited about. So, um, thank you. We should be get excited about it. It is a movement that's happened faster than, than I could even, ever expect. And one of the pieces that Dr. Cindy Daly and I spend really focused time is in working with farmers is, is that we watch our language because honestly, some farmers are climate deniers, they don't believe in it, and we need them to convert to regenerative. So, how do we engage them? We talk about not just profit, they can make more money because they're not writing checks to the fertilizer company anymore and that's money in their pocket, but also they build their ecosystem services so they can retain more water in water short areas because organic matter has increased. They can get healthier plants, less, less weeding, less herbicide needs, et cetera. All of that begins to benefit them. And we know then any water that runs off that farm is clean or cleaner. And so if we think in terms of the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico or the Chesapeake Bay and, and all those efforts in there, uh, the Delaware Bay, et cetera, we know that when we get the fertilizers, the phosphoruses and the nitrogens out of our farming systems, the life begins to return to those estuaries and those waterways. We know that the nitrates that are permeating a lot of people's groundwater in the Midwest or in the Central Valley of California because of agriculture, we will stop letting that leach down because we don't need them. The biological nitrogens are sort of on an as on demand basis as the plant signals and the organisms produce and they are digested and utilized and the plants dark green and healthy. I remember remarking to my wife a number of times, look at that corn because I know how much nitrogen corn, want, uh, corn needs. And it was dark green all year and we never applied any fertilizer. It's because of the biology. And, and this can happen very fast in your garden and on farms. And we want to help farmers get there. So how, Tim, how, how would this work in terms of scaling up to larger farms? How do you take something that works small? Is it possible to scale it up? Can you do this well, with long rows of, yes, of corn? Absolutely. No question. We have a 77 acre project um, on Howard Buffett's research farm in Arizona that we're in our past our second year now where it's a five-year project and in the first year on corn where we put just biological inoculant we almost we came very close within five percent of matching the yield of the 250 pounds of nitrogen and that was on soil that had been uh, abused by fertilizers over the years so the biology was nearly dead in it so we brought that much back that we could capture that much free nitrogen we produced so much nitrogen in that field, it amazed anybody, it amazed us. We also had one trial that had the biological inoculant plus only 15% nitrogen fertilizer compared to the regular 250 pounds, and that outperformed the full-blown nitrogen system. So the farmer walks out of it holding an ear of corn from only our biological pl plot. I mean, it was long strip of uh, strips within the 77 acres, it was all done by tractor. Um, and he holds that ear next to his ear from his fertilizer section in that field. And they look the same and he goes, why am I buying fertilizer? And that's what we want them to see because they don't have to write that check. 
And then as they start to see the other resiliency happen, it, it will change. There's a farmer in Australia, in Western Australia, who has been doing this for a number of years in barley, and they get very low rainfall. And the, the barley farmers are going broke there. And he has bought now 20,000 hectares of other farms because he gets over double the yield by only applying biology and then running sheep in to, to graze the stubble down afterwards. He's not applying any fertilizer, but he's doubling the yield. And this is what the biology and the fungal communities can do for the soil, for the water, for the nutrient creation and transportation, and for the farmer profit. So he keeps getting bigger and bigger and everybody else keeps going broke. Can it be on scale? Yes. Can it be profitable? Yes. Do we have it all figured out for every crop yet? No. But between farmers' creativities, our research and science, and trial and error, we'll get there because nature, if we pay attention, she'll show us how. So, um, oh, I guess 30, 40 years ago, Alan Savory was talking about the the benefits of holistic management in which you've got animals on, on in any biological situation and and one of the key points that he would make to farmers aside from it being a very holistic perspective was that you just immediately are saving money by not putting it all out in in fertilizer bills and what happens in holistic management which i'm sure you know better than i but what happens is that all kinds of things start to come back and people talk about not only the improvement of the crops and the improvement of the water cycle and water retention and the reappearance of long dried ponds and riverbeds but also the return of biodiversity yes and biodiversity is a much hotter so to speak much hotter item than it was than it's been uh until recently which is very unfortunate uh, and the organizations have been struggling about getting biodiversity better understood for for decades but now it's really on the front burner because we're having such serious biodiversity loss so when you talk about regenerative agriculture, I think people should realize that it's not just regenerating the soils and the agriculture. It's regenerating the, the whole biosphere, which, which includes cooling the climate. It does. Because that is a biology problem. It's not a high tech problem. It's not a physics problem. It's not a chemistry problem. It's right. a biology problem. So it is a biological and biology problem as well. One of the things that I was just flabbergasted by and, and humbled by, and this is where our, our, from a depth psychological terminology standpoint, our hubris, our ego gets in the way where we think we're smarter than nature. But I remember sitting in a pasture with Nicole Masters out of New Zealand, and she was talking about the compaction of that soil. And as an old farmer and a scientist, I go, well, what we need to do is get a big tractor in here with a ripper and break that up so we can get air and water down in that soil. And she said, and the issue is a biological issue. We need more of this and this, and she named the organisms. And to get that, we need more plants that are this and this, which will host those organisms. And it's just back to your point is that a diversity in our fields and all cover crops that we work with now are multi-species, eight to 10 to 12 species. And it will include some legumes, some grasses, you know, some forbs uh, and a very broad mix. What that means is there are different roots, different root depths, different root structures, different plants, and therefore different biology that will allow when the next crop comes in to be planted, cash crop, to be able to self-organize and utilize those organisms that it needs, they'll be present. And that's the kind of, uh, of healthy system that will come along. But let me talk about insects. One of the things is we love to spray our insects in agriculture because we get hit by pests. We get hit by pests when our plants are weak. It's like a lion hunting a pack of wildebeest. They look for the weak animals and they cull them out and eat them. Insects come to weak plants and any fertilized plant is weaker than a plant that has been raised in a healthy biological soil 
which has a resiliency and is not tasty to insects. They'll always run to the fertilized field and leave this healthy soil field alone. But also there's thousands of beneficial insects for every one pest. That's why we need to host a diverse sort of e either a windbreak or, or a, an open plot somewhere to even encourage the hosting of very biodiverse insect uh, uh, habitat. Uh, and that helps the whole system. That's crucial to all of our lives. I'll tell you one of the things about climate change that is never talked enough about is food production disruption. And this is the thing that affects every one of us, even if you're sitting there on the East Coast looking at our fires going, those poor Westerners, or we're looking at the South and say, look at those poor guys with the floods. You think these fires and these floods aren't gonna disrupt food production? Just increase the scale increase the erraticness of, of, of climate where you get a late frost or an early frost or you get no rain or you get too much rain. What happened in Iowa this year with the derecho? So much of those fields were laid flat. And this is where we have to uh, turn, bring this carbon down and we have to build resiliency into our food production systems and building a healthy soil lets it percolate and take water away faster, reduces flooding, and in drought years, it holds more moisture. So these are all elements of why this complex natural system, when we learn about her, respect her wisdom and work with it, we can enhance everybody's livelihood, including the non-human living forms on this planet. So are you finding that regenerative systems are doing much better in the face of these weather um, disasters? No question. If, if we go to Gabe Brown, when he, when he bought the farm from his in-laws, his water percolation rate in a heavy rainstorm was a half an inch of water per hour. Right now, his water percolation rate, because the soil has become healthy biologically, has aggregated, created air spaces, earthworms have created more air spaces, etc. It's 11 inches an hour. So how often do we get rain at 11 inches an hour? So he would get no runoff in these heavy storms, no flooding, no pooling, no drowning out of crops because the water goes down. And, and yes, we see more resilience coming without question. When you have fungal communities and you go into a drought, I remember this in West Texas years and years ago, where there was a drought and the cotton was just a few inches high, but this one guy had a field that it was like knee high. And this guy stopped him at the farm and knocked the door and said, why are you different than your neighbors? He said, oh, somebody told me to sprinkle these organisms out there on my field. And he said, what are they? He says, I don't know. And the guy said, can I take a plant? He says, sure. And he dug it up and took it to his lab along with uh, the neighbor's field that had the tiny little cotton plant. And the difference was fungal communities being attached to that root. So they were bringing moisture and nutrients to that plant in a living soil that doesn't happen in our tilled or fertilized fields. So yeah, resiliency is there. So there is hope. There is hope. Let's All right. Yes. Uh, and there are also a few questions. Please. So let's, let's see uh, what we've got. Um, we have someone who's asking about how to get her garden soil fungal dominant. So if, if you go on our website on the Johnson Sioux Bioreactor or the Bioreactor place, it will show you how to make a bioreactor. And they have a large scale one. And uh, I'm on the phone with David and his wife, Wei Chin, uh, every week. And they're in New Mexico, but we've made them an adjunct professor at Chico State. And, and I created, because in Africa, I kept thinking how when I went back, and we, my wife and I spoke there last year, she was talking about aflatoxins and I was talking about this work and uh, at a major conference. And I began to keep thinking, we've got to create this on a smaller scale for smaller scale farmers because it only takes a handful for your garden. You're not creating a bunch of compost like you do and go ahead and make regular compost and add it. That's great. But that's bacterial dominant because it's an anaerobic process. This process is aerobic it doesn't stink, it doesn't draw flies, it, does, it doesn't have leachate, it's up off the ground slightly, but you could make it in a smaller scale, just imagine it. I made one here and it seems to be working fine. I made it 
where I thought, gee, in Africa, many people weave baskets. They could just weave a round basket, put a, a, a floor up off the ground of, of a few inches so air can move around it and below it, and then make their, their composting anaerobic, I mean aerobic compost material in that. It takes 12 to 13 months, and it really takes that long because the organisms, the community of organisms in that uh, carbon-based system of leaf matter, or if you have cow manure, or if you have rabbit manure, you add to it. What happens is, is that the communities of the biology shift over those months, and it takes that time to get it to where it becomes fungal dominant, believe it or not. That's how long nature works. Keep it, if you're in Massachusetts, you might keep it near your house or your some building that's not going to take it down to zero. Uh, you'll have a popsicle. You probably won't kill it, but it will take it longer to mature. Okay. Um, other, other questions? Um, is there a Northeast version of, of the CSU resources? So I don't, nobody's quite doing the research we're doing, nor the extent, particularly towards the biological level and the farmer training we're doing yet. We want that to happen. I think University of New Hampshire has some uh, fairly good sort of more organic pieces. I think University of Vermont has some. Um, I know that, you know, a lot of the big institutions, we can go Tufts, et cetera. Some of them have some consciousness around this. But the thing about that Cindy and I and David Johnson bring to this discussion is farming experience ourselves. We come from a conventional science background, from a conventional agriculture background. We all evolved into this paradigm change in a whole systems, which most research has not done in whole systems, and in a biological living soil focus. And that I haven't seen well enough yet. And we hope it starts to take off problematically, where would the funding come from? This is not going to come from a big chemical company. This is not going to come from a, a marketing company that's going to sell X, Y, and Z every year to the farmer because you can make it yourself for your own backyard or for your farm, and you only need to apply it probably once or twice. You could apply it every year. Um, there's not a market. This is a free giveaway, open source. Here's how nature wants you to work. And she's always been giving things away for free, hasn't she? So, so is this. It's, it's out there for all of us. But we are also finding, I think, just in the past couple of years, that large corporations are, are catching on to the fact that their model is going to stop working sooner or later. And yes. So they need to invest now in the development of a new model. So the investments that some of them, I think, are starting to make is in this new model development. So they're not looking for a financial return on, on supporting these efforts. They're looking for uh, a knowledge and skill return that they can use because while it would be great if everybody grew, grew their own food, that's not going to happen anytime soon. Right. So there still may be a need for large scale providers. And they, I think they're starting to invest in what that means as far as, as their business. Um, as for the Northeast, we have the Northeast <coughs> Organic Farming Association. And I just might mention that uh, Dave Johnson and Tim both spoke at our conference three years ago. And while he was here, uh, Dave went up to the farm where the directors of NOFA live and have been doing organic farming for 40 years. And they started out a little bit skeptical, but after he showed them what was going on, they really got into it. So there may be programs at NOFA. I haven't been following it, but you might want to check it out and give them a call and, and ask them, tell them this is something that you want. And um, they'll connect with Tim or, and, and with Dave and um, 
yeah, uh, get it going. So, uh, Chris, I think that was your your question. Um, yeah, just uh, get get uh, get the ball the balls rolling. A question here about uh, about um, um, hydroponics for organic. What do you think of that? Well, we had a short conversation about that before this. Uh, we started today, and and my my concern about hydroponics is that it's not going to address climate. So, we have soil that's a carbon sink. It wants the carbon. The soil is deficient of carbon. The atmosphere is oversaturated, and the oceans oversaturated. So let's rebalance those. Let's bring that carbon back to the soil. Let's grow our food in the soil with this biology and let's capture that 10 tons per, per acre. But the other advantage I would think, and I, I always wanted to do the research and we haven't had the funds to do it. I wanted to go into hydroponics uh, production systems and take food samples and go to do some nutrient density analysis in that versus where the biology has brought like a, a boron element from in the soil because the plant signaled it needed it. And I just think nature is gonna do a better job of figuring out what it needs and provide it in a soil grown food. So, um, you know, the great thing about organic hydroponics is that you're kind of assured that it doesn't have chemical contaminants in it, but we're missing the other ecosystem services that the planet the soil and the waterways need uh, by a healthy living biological system. Okay, um, just apropos of, of hydroponics also, um, the regenerative, uh, the real organic project up in New Hampshire, and it's spearheaded by uh, Dave Chapman, who is uh, a tomato grower actually, um, has been making a, um, has been challenging the, the USDA, which um, recently made, gave hydroponics the organic uh, opportunity. And one of the points that came up was, no, they don't put toxics and other kinds of, of uh, inputs into the soil, into the, the water, but sometimes they, they put them underneath the water and that can kind of get into the, the growing process. Well, I hope I made myself clear. I am not a proponent of hydroponics and I certainly, oh, yeah. I have walked away from spending much time in the organic world. Uh, we at home grow organic, eat organic, buy organic or biodynamic. We do some biodynamic stuff too, but we use the Johnson Sioux um, inoculant in our soils. We believe deeply in it. But at our center for regenerative ag, and I've had this conversation with the CEO of Patagonia with some of the organic people and being at Rodale, as I said, I believe in it, but problematically, organic soils can be nearly as dead, if not as dead, as chemically farmed soils. It's just that the chemically farmed soils are killing the biology with fertilizers and, and those chemicals. And a lot of organic soils are being killed by tillage to control their weeds. And that's destroying the, um, the fungal communities. So you can end up with sort of nutrient deficits in both foods. And, and that's why a regenerative system is important. The reason we don't spend much time on organic conversations is we need to, to save this planet, convert the other 99% of the farmers. We've got to get them going regenerative. We hope the organic farmers go regenerative too, but we really want to talk to the 99% and we know we can get more chemicals out of our food system by working with those conventional farmers than we could ever hope to by working with the organic who've already taken them out of the system. So our focus is to have the language and the ability to talk with conventional farmers and to help them get to have a biologically diverse and healthy system and increase profit for them, but increase profit for the planet in this process. So Tim, have you had an opportunity to uh, advise Joe Biden uh, on these issues? I know Cory Booker 
during the democratic debates brought up uh, regenerative agriculture. So regenerative and agriculture, when we, when we made a definition four years ago, we knew it was going to take off. It wasn't because of us. We just, we, we had a sense it was going to go and people are going to co-opt it. So I heard most of the Democratic presidential candidates use that phrase. And I also knew most of them didn't know what it really meant. And no, I haven't had a chance to, to brief uh, Joe Biden on this at all. But in, in fact, I will say, I know Bernie Sanders got briefed fairly well on it because Audrey Denny, who's running for Congress in District 1 of California, um, she's worked with us. She understands it deeply. She's gone to Ghana, and I connect her with one of my friends there in Africa on some development work. And she can talk to you about regenerative agriculture nearly as well as anybody. And she wants to get not only into Congress, but on the committee, uh, agriculture committee. And those are the voices we're going to need in the policy world. If any of these candidates get serious and can extract themselves from the influence of the lobbying fertilizer chemical world in DC, um, we need to get them to understand from a climate and a human health and ecological health standpoint, this is our only way forward because it, it can happen tomorrow. Okay, another question. Um, what are your thoughts on the intersection between land reclamation and bioremediation of contaminated soils and regenerative agriculture in degraded and contaminated areas. Yes, 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 yes. This all works. Biology, um, as you know, both particularly with mycelium and, and, and actually there are bacteria. Uh, David Johnson was showing us a whole, he does these metagenomic analysis of what he finds in the soil and he goes, well now you know this bacteria does X, Y, and Z. This one and some of them break down specifically break down some of the toxins that we seem to want to produce and then just dump out there in the world. And so in many cases, biology will eventually remediate, break apart, digest, and make safe again for us. Sometimes not in the speed we want, but often they will help us get there. So we've got to stop making all these chemicals. In the United States, so many are unregistered, and so many that are registered, I, I don't even want to go into it they have gotten a free sort of free pass because we know the dangers of some of them and they're still out there very present in our world and they shouldn't be. But biology will break most of them down over time. Um, here's a question from uh, a professor at Community College in uh, Fall River, Massachusetts. And I know her and she actually began um, I think it's an organic uh, agriculture program at the community college a few years ago. But she's uh, asking, community colleges by their nature are connected to local communities, including area farms. Have you considered working with community colleges, particularly those who have agriculture programs? Yes, uh, you know, our biggest issue is we're, we're trying to create now collaboratively curriculum with uh, entities and um, some universities, there's a Southern Cross University in Australia that's creating a regenerative ag curriculum. They started a whole new ag program just around regeneration. And we're creating curriculum. We're also working with a, a Native American community college in North Dakota, both in some experimentation and working on this. And I'm personally, because I live six hours away from Chico, I'm in the San Luis Obispo area. I'm working with Cuesta College Community College right now because they're demanding to know about regenerative ag and they want to be able to get their students ahead of the curve with regard to understanding this paradigm change in agriculture. And, and for you and your community college and your interest, uh, yes, and, and we'd be happy to have you connect with us with regard to curriculum too as we begin to develop this. And, and, and Cindy Daly, who's our director uh, and a, a professor there at Chico, she wants to share. So just so you know, we're not gonna develop it and hold on to it. So help us build it and, and let's share it because the more people that learn, the better everybody's gonna be. Well, I'll make sure Nancy gets in touch with you. Great. And uh, a down to earth question here is, there a humidity requirement with the fungal community. Yes. You know, in, in uh, Sahara Desert, the fungal communities are not going to do very good. Where we get enough rain, fungal communities are going to do much better. 
Um, having said that, once established, they also help, as I said, bring water if it's a drought stricken time and they kind of protect themselves. But we got to get them established and we, and of course water and photosynthesis makes plants and it makes those organisms because then the plants feed those organisms. So that all takes water. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need 80 or 90% humidity outside. You can do that in California. We can do that here where we're much drier just so we irrigate and get the water to the plant, to the organisms. What can people living in cities do to promote biodiversity? Well, one of the things definitely is because as I said, we eat three times a day is start to demand regeneratively produced food. The companies will respond. Some companies know they have to respond and that will help push a change in our food system. Uh, do support your farmers. If you have farmer markets, go and talk to those farmers and ask them how they grow their food. And are they doing it regeneratively? And don't take yes as an answer. <laughs> You've got to ask the question more deeply. Are you rotating? Are you keeping your soil covered? Are you feeding the biology somehow? What, what's their knowledge base around that? And um, so, so do that as well. And I think that, you know, if you can grow a little bit out of pots or in a backyard, do that as well. Compost, even if it's just compost to put back, don't waste, don't put that, um, be sure that that carbon is used back in the soil. That's a way to get it active, to be a living, cycling carbon in the life of the soil. So there's all kinds of things we can do and talk to your school systems, your hospitals, your any institutions, change their, their buying patterns. Uh, we can begin to change the uh, a whole percentage of, of amount of food and how it's being produced and how it's being supplied. Uh, run for office. I mean, I could go on and on. There are so many things that we can do in the system to, to leverage this, to educate, and to ask for change. It takes, I think, six people to ask a grocery store for a product, and I think it shows up on the shelf. So let's get busy. Well, Tim, thank you so much for this both entertaining and enlightening talk. Um, those are a less, less common than the other kind. <laughs> and, um, and thanks to our audience for joining us. Well, thank you, Adam, and thank you uh, for this opportunity. And if there's any other questions, feel free to email me or connect with Adam and we will respond. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everybody.